Hello, and welcome to City Arts and Lectures. I am Courtney Martin, I'm a writer based in Oakland, California, and I am here with Yah Jesse, who is the author of Homegoing, um, a big, beautiful, best-selling novel, and her newest book, um, whose cover we should flash because it's just so gorgeous, Transcendent Kingdom, um, which we'll mostly be talking about tonight. Thank you so much for being with here with us in quotes. Yeah, it's so wonderful to be in conversation with you. Oh, thank you, Courtney. Thanks for doing this and, and for sharing this space with me tonight. Yeah. Um, so I want to jump right in by asking you about something that I know a lot of people are responding to, which is that your first novel, Homegoing, was what many people described as a very epic, right? It was like many generations. It was sort of like telescopic time. Um, and this one is actually a much smaller story. It doesn't entertain small questions, I should say, because mm -hmm. I think that would be a misunderstanding of it. But it, the plot itself is quite small. Um, many people might think you would do it in reverse. Your first book would be a smaller plot. Um, you sort of, you bit off a lot for your first book. What's your response to that? Did you ever think like, oh, this would have been easier first time around or <laughs> talk about that order of things? Um, no, it never really occurred to me. You know, I think the, the books, the subjects kind of choose you at the time that you are ready to approach them, um, maybe even before you're quite ready to approach them. Um, and I certainly felt for homegoing, even though I started it quite young and it took me a, a lot of time, it felt to me like it was concerned with all of those questions that I had when I was um, in my late teens, early 20s, trying to kind of investigate these connections between um, life in Ghana, life in America, uh, the descendants of, of enslaved people. Um, I felt like I, I really had so many questions um, that that book felt like the right vessel for it. Mm -hmm. um, and not that I don't have those same questions or that Transcendent Kingdom, as you said, is a book that shies away from big questions, um, but it just felt like the right time to, to pivot to something more more intimate. Um, mm. And again, the story just arrived when it arrived. It didn't feel, I didn't feel like I had any control over the order of the books. I love that language that a book chooses you. When and how did Transcendent Kingdom choose you? Do you pinpoint a moment? Yeah, I can pinpoint a couple of moments um, that I think are in conversation with one another. First is that after I finished a first draft of Homegoing, I set it aside um, because I like to give myself several months um, before going back to a work to edit. Um, so I had set it aside and I wrote this short story that I really liked the voice of. It was about a woman who was a Gerard Manley Hopkins scholar whose mother comes to stay with her. Um, Again, really liked it, um, didn't really know what to do with it. I sent it off. Uh, it was published in Guernica. I returned to homegoing and, and that just kind of took off and my life took off in this new direction um, and I kind of forgot about it. But years later, when I was starting to think about writing again around the time that Homegoing came out, um, one of my closest friends who at the time was getting her PhD at Stanford um, in neuroscience um, also had a pretty major paper that was about to be published. Um, and she was so supportive of my work. I wanted to be supportive of her work. I sat down to read the paper and I could not, like I literally could not penetrate what was happening um, in, any, in any of the paragraphs. Um, and so really just out of, out of sheer curiosity, I asked her if I could go shadow her in her lab to get a better sense of what she did all day. Um, and she said wow. yes, very generously. Um, and so I went to the lab and that day she was performing um, a surgery on her mice that I detail in the early chapters of this book. And I think that was like the moment that the wheels started turning for me about what a book like this might look like um, to kind of pair some of the research that she does with some of the things that I think about, um, some of the issues that I had been thinking about in that short story from, from years before. Wow, that is mm -hmm. so fascinating. I'm, I'm so interested in that moment where you're reading the, first of all, you're such a good friend, <laughs> like, which, which counts for a lot these days, I would say. So I, I love that you're such a good friend. But um, that moment where you're sitting down to read that paper and can't penetrate the language and I'm sure tons of jargon and protocols of that sort of genre 
And instead of setting aside, which I think is what most people would do, you got even more intrigued, which actually reminds me of the main character of Transcendent Kingdom, mm-hmm. who you you write as wanting to do hard things, that she's sort of attracted toward doing hard things. What is that about you? Like mm-hmm. what what made you pursue the paper further and the knowledge further versus setting aside and thinking like, well, that's my friend's thing, but this is not for me. Well, I think mostly it was just the fact of the timing in our lives that that these two things came up. One was my my novel, my first novel, um, and then this major paper. And it just felt like a weird imbalance that she could be so visibly supportive of my work and so well Um, well able to converse with me on the language of the kind of work that I do and that I was interested in and that I didn't it felt like I didn't have a way to reciprocate that kind of attention and care um, and I wanted to be able to Um, and she'd always talked to me about her work but um, obviously in lay people terms so I understood it to be about addiction and depression really generally and I didn't know beyond that what it what it meant um, and so I think it was a combination of curiosity um, but also just wanting to to show my support in a in a kind of tangible way hmm. That's so beautiful. And what is her response to this book? I'm so curious. (laughs) She's been really excited and again, super supportive. Uh, I told her really early on that I wanted to to write about uh, her work, her research. Um, And from then on, she was just the most generous person sending me articles that I might find interesting, um, books that I might find interesting, answering all of what I'm sure to her were very simple questions about the ins and outs of neuroscience. Um, and reading drafts of the novel and offering me feedback, um, not just on the elements that had to do with with the science, but um, but feedback in general. Um, so wow. she's she's great, and I love her. And she might be on this call. So that's awesome! Shout yeah. out to you. You know who you are. Um, are. Were there any funny? I just imagine like one of the things she was reading for was authenticity of like the life of a lab scientist, which is a real piece of this book. Is this? sort of sense of the emotional experience of being a scientist as someone who's never been anywhere near that. I felt it so vividly. Did she, mm-hmm. were there any funny things that she was like, a lab scientist would never do or say mm-hmm. that or any like points of surprise? Yeah, she was, yeah, there were some moments where where she would say things like that, but she was also pretty clear that there were kind of a variety of reasons um, why someone might come to science um, mm-hmm. and that for the character, um, some of the things that maybe wouldn't have made sense to a colleague of hers made sense in the context of the book. So I think she was a good reader um, from that from that perspective as, as well. And there's one moment where she was like, this would never happen. Um, and then later in the novel, she wrote, oh, but I see why it needs to happen for the plot. Ah. Um, and so, <laughs> so she gave me a little She let you get away with it. Nice. Yeah, she like figured out a way I could work around that particular issue. <laughs> okay, that's so interesting. Um, I love that this part of this was born of friendship. Um, mm-hmm. And part of it is is obviously born of your background and and these questions, some of which you you pull threads from homegoing. Um, you know, it's not like these two books are unrelated; they're just quite yeah. different settings. Um, I, you know, the central for those who haven't read it and are tuning in, sort of one of the central themes is science versus religion, and and actually not versus because part of the whole point of the book is breaking these things apart and showing the ways in which they both have such power, but also both have such limitations for understanding the value of a human life and why why people do what they do and that kind of thing, um, which made me wonder a lot about your your first experiences of both religion and science. Can you talk a little bit about your religious upbringing and how that informed some of how you thought about the novel? Sure. Um, I had a pretty similar religious upbringing to Gifty, um, although my kind of beginnings in religion are quite different from from Gifty's. When when my family first came to America, we were members of the African Christian Church, um, which was in Columbus, Ohio, and it was uh, predominantly West African, I would say kind of half Nigerian, half Ghanaian, um, and in a lot of ways it provided this kind of soft landing into American culture because we could still keep these connections to um, practices that we had through this community um, of of West Africans. Um, And then- And you were very young at that point, right? Like two years old? Yeah, very young. From age like two to five, six maybe. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, and then each place that we moved to subsequently, um, we lived in Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, and Alabama. Um, I would say that there were kind of fewer and fewer um, West Africans in general. So by the time we got to Huntsville, I was like Gifty attending a Pentecostal church that was predominantly white. Um, and that was kind of a, a different experience from the other churches that I had had um, and a jarring experience for, for a number of reasons. Um, and I think that kind of the environment of that that upbringing of that place, I think is one that I'm always or often returning to or thinking about in my work in some capacity or another. Um, though Transcendent Kingdom is certainly the book that I think explores it most deeply. Yeah, where you're really making sense of some of those childhood moments that you can now see through this adult lens and think yeah. quite differently about. Um, and what about science? Did you ever, I mean, I know this friend is really the one that that pulled you in as an adult, but as a kid, were you enamored or interested in science? I wasn't really, no, I didn't really have a scientific mind. I wasn't scientifically inclined. It was never the subject that I was um, was most interested in or very good at in school. Um, though I think the older that I, um, as I grew up, as I got older, I started to recognize an interest in it um, really from, just from this kind of obviously lay person perspective and the nonfiction books that I reach for most often are what I would call like kind of sciencey creative nonfiction. Like I love hmm. books like Yule Abyss's On Immunity or books like Emperor of All Maladies um, or Being Mortal by Atul Gawand. Like I, I really enjoy kind of dissecting um, the literature from that, from that lens of, of a lay person. So while I never really had an interest in science in school, I've, I've developed a, um, I've developed a curiosity around it in my adulthood. That's so interesting. Um, so I want to switch and think a little bit about sort of like your trajectory as a writer. So, you know, your first book, as you mentioned, when you, you know, your friend was being so supportive was this like explosive hit. And then you're writing the second book and obviously there's like a tremendous amount of pressure that I'm sure you felt in that. How did you block out that sort of external critic and pressure and audience that you'd probably to your own surprise? I mean, you're so talented, but I think anybody is surprised by having a hit first book like that. Um, how did you block that out so you could really like stay true to your own creative process? Um, it took me a while and it was harder than I was expecting. I think because I am a person who has been writing for much of my life, it never really occurred to me that after publishing a novel, I would I would have some difficulty kind of returning to writing. But I did after home going. There were several months where I didn't feel as though I could find the kind of quietude that I needed in order to really dig into a new project. Um, and I think it took a few things. One is just learning how to say no to the public facing side of this career, um, starting to say no to um, events and um, interviews and that kind of thing to carve out literal time mm -hmm. um, and space um, because I was also traveling a lot. Um, so that helped. And then I, I did another thing, which I had never done before, which is that I started attending residencies, um, and again, for the, for the actual time and space uh, to kind of just spend devoted to a new work. And that was really helpful as well. Um, but in terms of the kind of internal pressures um, that I was feeling around having to try to work on a second book, um, I don't know how I got around that other than just kind of trusting that because I have always seen my way through a book before that I would figure out what I needed to do to see my way through another one. Yeah. Um, and, and that was, that was a reminder that I needed to kind of keep giving myself. That's great. I'm sure yeah. you must have had some fortitude during the first book process of saying, I want to write a book this sprawling and I can handle it. And so you already had the muscle of you know, being able to sort of coach yourself and know what you were capable of. And do you think that helped at all that you've always, it seems as if you've had a real independent mind about what, what your creative project was? Yeah, I think so. I think I've always had a great deal of confidence, um, perhaps hubris when it came to my work and, and kind of my ability to to figure a way through a, a book. And so I think um, that certainly helped. I had already 
done this this huge thing that felt um just felt impossible when I started it um and and I had finished it and seen it through and seen it receive so much um so much love and support and so um, I think that only kind of encouraged me to to try again that's awesome um another question about audience I was really curious there's a moment um where Gifty who's the main character of the book and the daughter and a lot of this book is about the relationship between a daughter and a mother which we haven't quite said for those who haven't read it yet. So I'll say that. Um, There's a moment where she's trying to get stories out of her Ghanaian immigrant mom. And you write, but there was no war in my mother's stories. And if there was hunger, it was of a different kind. The simple hunger of those who have been fed one thing, but one another, a simple hunger, impossible to satisfy. I had a hunger too. And the stories of my mother filled me, uh, excuse me, and the stories my mother filled me with were never exotic enough, never desperate enough, never enough to provide me with the ammunition, which was so beautifully put. And it made me think a bit about audience and being a writer uh, of, of your caliber and scale now and, and your own relationship to that audience's hunger for stories of war and, you know, being an African immigrant and home going, having, you know, slavery and other like really powerful um, topics that that I just wondered is is part of, you know, you and your audience in that a little bit. Like, how do you think about your audience's hunger for the kinds of stories you tell? Yeah, I think I, I was certainly thinking about that. And I'll say too, that particular passage um, that you just read from came about um, not in the first draft. I had read part of this novel, um, the beginning pages of this novel, at this residency that I was doing in Berlin, um, and it was my first time sharing any of the book with with anyone. And I'm also usually very, very um, private about a book that isn't finished, so um, it felt weird to be sharing it in any capacity. Um, but it it went well. Everyone was was really encouraging. Afterward, um, as people were kind of milling about and talking to me this woman um, made this comment that was just like, I don't understand why the family moved, like what was going on in their home country that made them move? Um, was there was there a war or something? Hmm. And I thought, oh, that's such a weird assumption to make, but it is an assumption that many people make. And it's a narrative that we see a lot about immigrant families, that something terrible is happening, that the home country is awful. And these are the reasons that, that people move. Um, and that was not the case um, and for my family. It's often not the case for um, for many families, like sometimes you just want to move. Sometimes you just kind of want to seek an opportunity elsewhere, and it doesn't mean that that there's something terrible about your home country. Um, so that that um, inclusion, that that moment that um, that I ended up including in the novel, I think was kind of to address that desire that people seemed to have to want to kind of see um, to see a difficult story, see a, a, a um, a story of, of war or famine or whatever it, it may be, um, and to say that that's, that's, there are myriad reasons why people immigrate, and, and that doesn't have to be one of them. Right. That's so interesting. And, and this family, I feel like, embodies, because of, you know, the father going back and, and the heartbreak over that, but, like, the conflict, like, there's this sense of not, like, exotic, I mean, not um, romanticizing America, and mm-hmm. what it's provided for this family. In some ways, it's provided profound burdens that yeah. that you can see showing up in in like Nana's life, and but also not vilifying America. Like it feels like you're really dealing in the nuances there mm-hmm. um, in a way that I thought was really powerful. Was that important to you to sort of give a sense of like America is not the answer and it's not a hell? It's like all of these things mixed up. Yeah, definitely. You know, I wanted to kind of complicate um, the American dream narrative that we so often hear for um, for Gifty and Nana's mother. Um, America was certainly a place of opportunity. She dug her heels in, decided that she wanted to make a life here um, and was able to do so. Um, but for their father, it was a place that provided nothing but misery, basically. He was working more than he wanted to work, um, seeing less of his kids than he wanted to be seeing, um, experiencing racism in ways that he had never experienced it before, um, and decided that he that he it wasn't cut out for it um, and, and decided to leave. And I think that that, um, that, that choice is, is just as valid as any other. And so I wanted to have a book that, um, that addressed all of the choices that one, or many of the choices that one might make around making a life here. 
Yeah, that was beautifully done. Um, you had such a beautiful line about Nana. So Nana is um, Gifty's brother. Um, and you write of him, it breaks my heart now to see that face, to recognize the lie of masculinity sitting atop the shoulders of a young child. Oh, just like broke my heart because it mm. was the perfect wording for, you know, what you see of so many, uh, you know, adolescent guys, but really guys in general. Um, and so many things break him, right? He is this absent father who clearly breaks his heart by going back to Ghana as, as just discussed. He's sort of objectified as an athlete in this way that, you know, you can imagine is, is sort of soul crushing. Cause it's like, he's only adored for his athletic ability. Mm -hmm. Um, America itself, you know, the microaggressions, the racism, um, but can you talk a, a bit more about that masculinity sitting atop the shoulders of a young child? Where did you get the inspiration for that? Mm. Well, I was thinking about the ways that both of these children, but certainly Nana in that moment, um, had to kind of grow up too fast, had to find themselves um, just taking care of their mother, taking care of their mother's emotional state um, in a way that we wouldn't assume children need need or should be doing. Um, and so in that moment, um, Nana is, is realizing that his father is not going to come back. Um, and I think he's feeling this burden of having to be the man of the house, um, even though he's still very young. Um, and, and suddenly he finds himself kind of in this posture of, uh, of masculinity um, that, that doesn't suit him, that doesn't really fit him yet, if it ever would or, or needed to. Um, and so I think I think, as you said, it's something that we that we can recognize in a lot of young children who um, have these circumstances where they end up needing to kind of um, step up to be um, more adult than they necessarily would have, maybe because mm. a family member is ill and they need to provide financially, or maybe because a family member um, works these insane hours as as Gifty and Nana's mother does. Um, and so I think that's what I was trying to kind of get at is that there's this moment in the book where you can visibly see Nana kind of changing, um, yeah. growing up. Um, and suddenly he's not, he's not the child he was at the beginning of this bus ride. Right. But not prepared for right. being the Without, adult he's being exactly. pushed into being. Yeah. With none of the tools to, to handle this. Yeah. The other, one of the pieces of the book that affected me most emotionally was this sense of Gifty as being a witness of suffering. You know, her mother comes and visits her and is depressed and can't get out of bed. Her brother becomes addicted um, and she has to watch him cycle through addiction. Um, and you wrote so vividly of the helplessness of being, of loving people who are depressed or addicted or stuck. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? Is that something you've experienced? Is that something you've you've watched over the years or you've loved in other literature? Um, I think it's mostly just being witness myself to experiences that other people were having um, and recognizing, in particular for this character, Gifty such a... Um, she's such a curious person. She's definitely, she's got a lot of questions and she doesn't really know where to put them. She's experiencing absences on these multiple levels, the physical absences of her father and her brother um, after uh, he moved back to, to Ghana and passed away respectively. But she's also experiencing this emotional absence, this emotional distance from her mother, um, who just doesn't really have the capacity for much of this novel to give Gifty what she wants and deserves. Um, and so Gifty, I think as a character who is very invested in kind of goodness, in striving, um, in, in working and in control, um, mm -hmm. turns out to be a person who is thrust in all of these chaotic situations and doesn't have very much control. And so you recognize in that striving, um, in that exactness, um, in that drive for goodness, that these are the areas of her life that are so carefully calibrated um, because it's the only place in her life where she feels any control. The helplessness of her childhood, um, the chaos of her childhood has left her 
with with little little else. Um, and so I think she's a character who has become very reticent, very guarded, um, but it is because of that early helplessness. And that's another thing that just like not painting America as either a heaven or hell. I felt like you did this beautiful job of pointing out that there's the dynamic in the book of control versus desire, right? Like this is part of what she studies. It's part of what shows up in addiction. And she's very in control as a character, but you don't romanticize control. You do this beautiful job of saying like control will get you A's control will get you the lab position control will get you the beautiful paper. Um, but control is not always a good thing. And, mm. and I felt like I hadn't really read that before. That felt like so fresh to me. How did you come to that, that sort of point of plot? Um, how did you get that inspiration? Um, well, just thinking about Gifty's childhood and her background, and again, like who she would have become um, as a person who was formed by these multiple traumas in her childhood, um, that obsessiveness with which she approaches her work certainly is great in a lot of ways. It makes her one of the best in her field. It's earned her this, this acclaim, um, this position within, within her field that she can be very proud of. Um, but wondering, what I was wondering as I was writing, is this a mentally healthy place to be? Um, particularly when she's so, so incapable of even admitting to herself, um, let alone anyone else, why she does the work that she does. She tells us that it's because she felt like it was the hardest thing that you could do and she wanted to do the hardest thing. But as we read, we recognize that, well, wait, no, there's also this, this family trauma um, yeah. that you're trying to work through, through this work. Um, and so I was trying to kind of complicate that idea that, um, that you know, the kind of certainly for, for the black respectability politics that we hear a lot about, um, if you are a, a black person of a certain age, you were kind of steeped in this, in the, these ideas that all you need to do is to strive and suddenly, um, the, the world will open up to you, um, and you will be able to leave behind some of the racism that you encountered. Um, and, and that's never true. Um, and it's certainly not true for Gifty who has lost so much. Um, and, and that, that sense of, of, um, just of needing to kind of be in control of everything, I I think doesn't so serve her ultimately. Right. It doesn't help. And at her. what it price? Save her. Right. Exactly. At what price do you have that sort of external achievement that makes it look like you've transcended to the point of your title something? Right. Um, I, one of the things I, ha I had this feeling as I was reading, you had this beautiful, I keep reading your own book to you, but it's just so gorgeous. I can't <laughs> help it. Um, you said, I don't know what thoughts ran through Nana's mind in those days. I wish I did. Because of my career, I would give a lot to be able to inhabit someone else's body, to think what they're thinking, feel what they're feeling. For a copy of Nana's thoughts from birth to death bound in book form, I would give absolutely everything. Um, as I, And this is a sister writing about a brother. And as I was reading, I was thinking, that's what you gave us. Like this <laughs> is gifty. This is a book of gifty's thoughts and feelings and her internal life. And particularly because she's so in control um, and a very guarded uh, person, I f it felt almost illicit. Like I was like, I can't mm. believe I get to know what she's thinking. And I was wondering if as a novelist, you develop a relationship with her as a character. And did you ever feel like almost guilty? Like you were like exposing her or something? I know that's kind of a weird question, but I, I had such a real feeling about her that I wondered if that happened to you as yeah. the writer. Yeah, it's a good question. This is my first time writing in the first person for any su sustained amount of time. Um, you know, Homegoing was uh, was in the third person. And for most of the novel, particularly the earlier chapters of the novel, it was in a really kind of pulled back omniscient third. Um, and so I could know anything that I wanted to know about any of the characters and uh, what they were experiencing, what they might have heard, what they might have seen. Whereas in this book, all I had was Gifty. Um, and as you say, she's not a particularly forthcoming character. Um, and even to me, I felt like there were, there was this kind of, um, this unreliability that I was trying to tease out. She's not necessarily, I think, a completely unreliable narrator, um, but she is unreliable mostly because she does not know herself or does not mm. want to kind of approach um, the areas of herself that, that 
uh, that diverge from the narrative that she's trying to tell about herself. Um, and so it became for me, I think, a project of trying to figure out ways to see around what Gifty was telling us so that we could actually see her um, beyond mm. what she was willing to say, beyond what she was willing to reveal. Um, and I think that's partly what the, what the uh, diary entries that we see are, yeah. is, is, is doing. Like we get to see Gifty at her most vulnerable, at her most raw. She's using these code names for her family members in great part because it's the only thing that allows her to speak candidly. And she never speaks candidly about her family in any other place in the novel um, or to any other person in the novel. Um, and so, yes, I do think there was something kind of illicit about giving so much of this character who did not want to um, be seen, who did not want to be um, kind of captured on the page. Um, but that was also, I think, one of the one of the pleasures and the challenges of writing this book. Well, it's, it's definitely a pleasure of reading it is feeling mm -hmm. like you get this, you know, internal world of someone who is so unreachable otherwise. And, and you know, reminds you of people like that, that you've like wanted to have that access to. So it's, it's so beautiful. Um, I'm going to go to audience questions soon. So if you have them, put them in the chat. Um, you write this other thing. I believe in God. I do not believe in God. Neither of these sentiments felt true to what I actually felt. And I so related to that, but I wondered, can you talk about what your relationship to God is these days? And, and kind of, is that representative? That's gifty talking, but I'm wondering if that's representative of, of how you think about these things, especially in such turbulent times where I think a lot of us are asking some of the big questions you ask in this novel about God and science and what mm -hmm. is all of this about? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I would if I would put it the same way as Gifty, um, but I do find, um, you know, having spent so much of my life, my younger years in the church that I don't feel the kind of um, ease with kind of shrugging off the things that I used to believe that um, that I might have expected as I as I grew older and started to kind of turn away from the teachings of my church. Um, so I do still have kind of a complicated relationship to the religion of my childhood, um, but I can't, yeah, I suppose similarly to Gifty, like I can't cast it off completely um, or I'm not willing to cast it off completely. So I'm, I'm interested in, um, in existing in that kind of, that I believe in God. I do not believe in God's space. I hear it even the way you talk about like in the beginning of this conversation, the novel finding you, like there's something about that that's a bit supernatural or sort of mm -hmm. like, I mean, maybe faded, you know. Um, do you write with a more of sort of a religious or a scientific bent? Like, are you super, mm -hmm. you know, practical and like, I need to do this number of pages by this date and blah, blah, blah. Or are you like, the muse has to find me and I have to like open up the vessel or something in between? <laughs> Something in between. I've never really been one of those people who believes in in the muse um, needing to kind of be a coworker with me in order for the, for this work to happen. Um, but nor have I ever been a, like a strict believer that I am in charge or I am the god of this world and I'm making it all up. Um, obviously, I recognize that I am making it all up, but it feels like something in the middle. Um, I don't plan um, anything before I start writing. So I'm not a, I've never had outlines. Um, I don't do character sketches. Um, I really do feel like I'm just kind of fumbling my way through the world, trying to see what can be seen um, and figure out where I need to go one sentence at a time. Um, I wish I could remember which writer to attribute this to. I wanna say it was Dr. Rowe who said something like, writing is like driving a car in the pitch black dark with your headlamps on. You can only see that little stretch of road in front of you, but that mm. stretch is enough to get you to the next stretch and the next. Mm. Um, and that's really how I feel about it, that it's just, I'm. I'm not, it's not a muse thing, but I'm like allowing the next stretch of road to be revealed to me, whatever that mm. might be. And it's also probably why you need those two months, which I'm like, note to self, that's a very wise, <laughs> wise thing to build in. Those two months of space from a book before yeah. you go back to it, because then maybe, yeah. you know, it's morning and you can actually see the full road because you've had enough time away yeah. from it. it How was the editing helps. process for this book? Was it, was it, um, a lot of work or was the book sort of like in a pretty good shape once you got there? 
Um, a mix of both. I found this much harder to edit than um, than Homegoing. Um, Homegoing, I think, was even though it was big and ambitious, um, it also had these really nice constraints that made it clear for me to understand um, how the book was operating. Um, so the fact that I wanted to cover a certain number of years um, meant that I kind of approached the chapters almost mathematically. Like I knew I needed um, to have 14 POV characters to get from roughly 1750 Gold Coast to roughly, you know, present day America. Um, I knew that I wanted to cover roughly 20 years per chapter. Um, and so that felt really kind of tight and contained. And because the chapters were so discreet, I knew when I was editing that if I changed something in one chapter, it wouldn't have too big of an impact on the other chapters, um, or the impact would be easy to, to kind of see and clean up. Mm. Um, Transcendent Kingdom was the opposite experience. Editing felt like like a game of Jenga. Like if I if I pulled one thing out, the entire novel could collapse. And partly that was a matter of um, of structure. Um, this book is nonlinear, um, and it's also it's just like a lot looser than than Homegoing was. Um, the present story, the front story, is really really kind of still and placid. It's just a woman whose mother has come to stay. Her mother very rarely gets out of bed in the front story, so there's not really much action. So what you're really dealing with in the novel are these moments of Gifty reflecting on her childhood and trying to make connections between what happened in her childhood and the work that she was doing now. Um, and that felt like more of a delicate balance for, for editing than Homegoing did. Yeah. Um, so it, it it wasn't it wasn't as though the the notes that I was given um, to approach editing were hard. It was just that it was my first time editing something of this length that didn't have that really tight um, and kind of discreet construction. Yeah, it's also interesting because it your first book had that you needed the development of like a socio political centuries long, you know, the development had to be logical along this like huge expanse of time whereas with gifty it had to be it was psychological development which in some ways almost seems harder to get mm -hmm. right because it's so subtle and nuanced mm -hmm. especially with the characters you pointed out who may not really know herself mm -hmm. uh, you know her own unconscious which is another wonderful theme of the novel is like our conscious versus our unconscious and subconscious like isn't all there so for you as the novelist to pull that through is such an art as opposed to, you know, this happened in this year in America, this happened, you know, right. so it's, I could see how the editing of that would be really complicated. Okay. So, so many people want to ask you things. I have to hand over the <laughs> reins for a few minutes. Um, and also I wanted you to know, we have all these high school students who are listening, which is really cool. So oh, if you're wonderful. listening, high school folks, please write questions. We would love that. Um, what were your experiences with Ghanaian storytelling as you grew up? Um, and I was also wondering just generally, um, you know, how you became a writer. Was it the kind of thing that like as a little girl you were hearing stories either in the Ghanaian tradition or any tradition and were, was like, that's what I want to do? Or is it a longer developing thing? Mm -hmm. um, well, I definitely heard a lot of stories growing up. Um, I think there's that need to kind of tell stories in order to preserve this place uh, that you no longer live in, but that you want um, to carry on for your children um, and for just for the rest of the community that you're a part of. Um, and so my, my family was always really, I think, deeply invested in community. My parents were um, were often kind of throwing gatherings for other West Africans. Um, and through these gatherings, I think I got a lot of stories. Um, and perhaps those were kind of the first seeds of my understanding or thinking about narrative and storytelling. Um, hard to say, but I'm sure, I'm sure that that's involved in the process. Um, but also, I just was a really big reader as a, as a child. Um, and I think, you know, for me, there was something really kind of 
um, grounding about the fact that everywhere we moved, I could go to the library, get a library card, and suddenly it felt like I truly lived there, uh, or that I had kind of a stake in the place. Um, and so libraries became really important to me. Um, and that was really kind of the beginning of my writing life. I always, um, even to this day, feel like the reading comes first. Um, like me as a reader is, is more of a, um, more of a presence than me as a writer. It matters more to me um, than me as a writer. Um, and the writing feels like just an extension of that love for reading. Like I just always wanted to, to be a part of this thing that I loved so much, which was uh, the literature that I was reading. Mm. Um, and so I think that's how it started for me. It was just trying to see if I could participate in some way in this thing that I loved, which was books. Wow, that's so beautiful. I, I often describe reading as my spiritual practice, thinking of like these questions of religion and yeah. what grounds you and what makes you feel like in touch with the meaning of life and all of this is like, and also in this time of sheltering in when so many people are talking about like, how do you stay sane? How do you, you know, I find that if I don't read I start to feel a little crazy. And then if I, I'm like, oh, I haven't read today and I like sit down and read a book, it's like, oh, this this is like, I can position, you know, sort of ground myself again. Is that during this time of sheltering in, have you been reading a lot and taking a lot yeah. of solace in that? I have been, it, it's fluctuated. I would say like there were definitely months where I was reading more than I have ever read. Um, and then there were some months where I felt like my attention span was completely shot. And I was just like, you know, going from tab to tab uh, of different news uh, articles online and, and that didn't feel right or healthy to me. Um, and so there was, it's, you know, I was never really the kind of writer who needed to put like apps like freedom and self-control on my computer to keep from looking at things. Um, but this has been a time where I've recognized that I, I just had like an, an unhealthy relationship to the news. Um, yeah. And once I realized that, I was like, you know, the antidote to this is always deep attention. Mm. Um, and that for me has only ever come from, from reading books. And so um, turning away from that and turning back to the books that, that allow me to feel that kind of deep attention has been, as you say, like a, a, a balm in this time. Yeah. Um, I think this comes from one of our young writers, probably young high school students. What, what advice would you give an aspiring young author or what would you wish you knew when you were writing your first book? Um, well, it sounds like an, an easy answer, but it's really the, it's really, you know, the thing that I, that I, um, that I truly think helps um, is, which is just to read as much as possible and as widely as possible. Um, read things that are not in a genre that you're comfortable with. Read things that um, explore ideas and subject matters that you know very little about. I think. Um, curiosity is such an important part of writing um, and you never know where your ideas are going to come from um, and so to stay open to the possibility um, of, of something kind of touching you um, I think is is key and reading helps with that mm. um, and then the other thing that I would say and this is for people who are kind of interested in publishing and are feeling as though they're near a place where they can start entering or dipping their toes into that world um, is to finish your entire project first. This is particularly for fiction writers, but finish your entire book first. Um, don't have like 30 pages and then start trying to find agents. I don't think that that's helpful. Um, I think once you get a first draft done, you can start to see what you really have. And also you start to understand what the work means to you, what you want it to be before other voices start to filter in. That's great advice. Um, how did you know any writers growing up? No, <laughs> none. Because I think the other thing, especially if a young person is asking that feels so important about what you've done is, you know, you're this Ghanaian immigrant woman who was living, you know, in the South and didn't know any writers, and you were still able to conjure up, um, you know, it makes me think about the power of speculative fiction itself and like conjure up the notion that you could be a writer mm -hmm. and that you could write these stories. For example, this one, which is very specific to mm -hmm. a lot of the things you knew and experienced and got curious growing up, um, uh, got curious about growing up. How, where did that 
I mean, I, I, the word that's coming to mind is entitlement, not a negative way, in a totally positive way. Like, where did mm-hmm. that come from that you were like, I'm entitled to write these stories and become a writer, period. And even though I don't know a writer, because um, I think that's one of the hurdles for a teenager, especially who doesn't come from a background where they would, you know, know about the publishing industry or, know, you know, think that this was an actual thing that they could do. Um, where did that come yeah. from for you? Where did it come from for me? I honestly, it just, I felt like I almost, it almost felt like I had no choice but to do it. Like I felt mm. so, so deeply moved by, um, by this desire. So kind of um, single-minded about this desire, even from a really young age. Like I think it was, I was in high school when I started kind of openly declaring that I wanted to be a writer. Mm. Um, and I felt kind of inadequate to any other, um, any other task, any other work. Um, so it didn't feel, I didn't really feel like I had any other options, though obviously I did. Um, when I got to college, I was lucky enough, um, and even before college, I should say too, some of my um, middle school and high school teachers, but I, I was really fortunate to have teachers in my life who took me seriously um, from, from that young of an age, um, who kind of looked at my work and looked at me and told me that this was something that I could do, that I had the talent for. Um, and I think that that was really invaluable too. Um, when I was when I was in my last year of college, I went around to a few of my mentors um, asking them like what my next steps should be. Um, and they all said to take a year off um, before deciding to apply to an MFA program. Um, and I had never heard of MFA programs before going to college, um, but after I felt like it was the right thing to do. And I remember taking this year off and I was working like a, a job um, in San Francisco um, that I hated. And I just felt like I, 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 I don't want to do anything else. There's nothing else that speaks to me. And I know I'm really fortunate um, to have that kind of um, that dream align with um, with the other factors that are often limiting for people who have dreams of the arts, um, but it felt it just felt kind of inevitable. Mm. And in high school, when you said I'm going to be a writer, what was your parents' reaction? Because you can imagine some <laughs> immigrant parents would be a little bit, you yeah. know, there's that that yeah. stereotype of immigrant parents being like, go be a doctor, go be a lawyer. Were they supportive or were they? I definitely had the go unsure. be a doctor, go be a doctor specifically um, brand of parents, Okay, um, um, which was, it was hard, I think, for me to kind of not to break away from the expectations, um, mostly because I was like a really uh, bright and again, curious child. And I was like doing all of the right things. And I understood um, the great sacrifices that my parents had made. And you almost feel as though you're you're kind of rejecting um, this investment that they have put into your life when you, uh, when you go your own way or follow your own path. Um, but I felt, um, I felt really strongly about this. And I felt really strongly about, um, I felt really kind of, assured in my ability to make this work in some capacity or another. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't know if I would be able to kind of financially support myself just from my writing. Most writers don't. Mm -hmm. Um, But I knew that whatever I did, I was going to figure out a way to make space for writing. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, Someone else asks, how do you connect your novel Homegoing to today's social climate or the Black Lives Matters movement? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I think Homegoing was a book that was kind of trying to um, look at what it meant for racism to become institutionalized. It wanted to kind of observe this long tale of history um, that led us to this present moment um, I started writing it in 2009, um, so it was before the official like start of the Black Lives Matter movement, but certainly the, the elements that have led to this moment um, have been here forever. You know, they're kind of evergreen, unfortunately. Um, a novel like Homegoing was always relevant um, and hopefully will not always be relevant in the same way. Um, but it didn't feel like a response to this moment, it didn't feel like um, like it was kind of born out of this moment. Um, it felt just like an, an attempt to grapple with this legacy, this inheritance that we have here, um, the kind of twin legacies of colonialism and slavery. 
Yeah, it feels like a moment, um, you know, it's a weird, it wouldn't make sense to say the novel was before its time because it was always, you know, it's been relevant since 1619 and before, right? But mm -hmm. but it, it was ahead of sort of the cultural moment in the sense that I think a lot of people have been thinking so much about embodied memory and generational trauma and even some of like Resma Menikin's work. He's the author of this book called My Grandmother's Hands that I've read during this time that I think a lot of people have read about the way in which trauma, like racial trauma is embodied. And I feel mm -hmm. like your novel was getting at so many of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just interesting to think about. I wonder if that person's question is in part because it feels like the culture caught up to your novel. Mm -hmm. I mean, the larger culture, maybe we could say white culture in, in particular, um, mm -hmm. has caught up to your novel in a certain way. Does it feel like that at all to you? Um, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that, um, but Perhaps, yeah, perhaps that is part of what's going on is, is white culture catching up to these, these questions, these ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, which gets back into that fascinating thing of audience and, you know, you, as you point out, you write the book you need to write because it, it picks you, but it's interesting to think about how it hits an audience at different moments mm -hmm. um, and how this one might, might hit an audience. I mean, I think certainly the notion of, of a culture right now just filled with layers and layers of grief. And this book has so much grief in it and has so much witnessing of suffering by those close to you. And that feels so of yeah. the moment as well. Um, let's see, how much time do I have? I'm looking for other great questions. Um, what do you feel are the big connectors in the plot, main ideas, et cetera, between homegoing and transcendent kingdom? Mm. Um, I think the main thing is, again, this question of what we make of, what we do with trauma that we have inherited, maybe trauma that doesn't that isn't ours, but that we take on. Um, both of these books are, are, I think, interested in looking how at looking at how um, trauma moves within a family. Obviously, the family and homegoing is very large, and the mm -hmm. family and transcendent kingdom is very small. But it's the same idea. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that they are both, in in some ways, they are both books that are asking. Um, how we make sense of a life and a world in which senseless things happen, like how mm -hmm. we continue to kind of push forward, to strive, to um, make lives for our children, um, have children, all of these things, um, when we understand that there is a kind of randomness um, and senselessness um, to, to some of the aspects of, of being alive. Mm. Um, the other thing that a, a reader points out or a, a listener points out between the two books is that you write so beautifully about motherhood and daughterhood and the relationship mm -hmm. between daughters and mothers, which I also found so exquisite in this book, well, in both your books, but having just read about this one, um, what's that about? I mean, do you, do you feel like, is that something throughout literature that you're really attracted to? I kept wondering, like, are there mother-daughter relationships in other novels that you were particularly moved by and inspired by? Yeah, definitely. It's it's a topic that I really love to read in literature. Um, um, recent books that I think have done this really beautifully, uh, Writers and Lovers by Lily King, which mm. just came out this year, um, takes that on. Um, another book that I loved um, came out a couple of years ago uh, was My Name is Lucy Barton by Elizabeth Strout, which I think mm. also is interested in, in this kind of thorny mother-daughter relationship. Um, yeah, it's something that I, that I am often drawn to just in my own reading habits. And, and so it was nice to kind of offer, um, something, contribute something to that, to that ongoing, um, that ongoing canon. Yeah. So for, you know, you mentioned that your parents kind of wished originally that you'd gone the doctor out. Um, obviously they must be deeply proud of you, but, um, what did they say about this novel or, or both of your novels? Like what's their response now to the work that you do? Um, really supportive, really, I think happy for me to, um, to be living out this thing that, um, that I've wanted to do for so long. I think it's been, um, gratifying for, for them as well as for me to, to see it come to pass. Yeah. They must be so proud. Um, yeah. a last question for me, and then I've, I've asked you to read to close us out. 
Um, you write, what's the point of all this is a question that separates humans from other animals. And this is part of what you mean by the transcendent kingdom that we transcend mm. the kingdom by, by wanting to know what's the point of all this. Um, and I think that's a question a lot of people are asking themselves in 2020, the garbage fire that is 2020 of just like, oh my God, what is the point of all this? And sort of looking at our own lives and our own professions and saying like, does this even matter, this thing I do? Um, and so it made me wonder about you and how you're feeling about the role of a novelist in this mm. moment. Mm. Well, I've been, I mean, on the one hand, I've just been so thankful that I have um, this work that really allows me, I think, to um, just think through some of my own feelings, some of my own questions, that gives me a place to kind of feel, um, to feel as though I'm kind of creating a sense of order um, in the chaos that is this time. Um, and so I've been mostly just really, um, just feeling really, really grateful that I can write. Um, but I think what the role of the novelist in all of this is. I read this really great essay um, by Dr. Lauren Michelle Jackson about, um, I think it was titled like, what is an anti-racist reading list for? Mm. Um, and she was expressing, I think, some confusion about the fact that the bluest eye was popping up um, in all of these anti-racist reading lists um, because it's not a, what she calls race reader. Um, it's not like the kind of book that's like trying to teach you what to do. Yeah. Um, but she says that uh, racism in this book is just the environment. It's just like, it's just what is happening. It's weather. Um, and that part of the pleasure um, or the, the reason that we read books like this is to experience that weather, to understand what it looks like, um, mm. to see it. Um, and I think that, that that's what any novel is providing you, um, whether they are dealing explicitly with, with the moment or not, um, they are allowing you to kind of live in the weather, to experience the environment. Wow, that's so beautifully put, given we're in the middle of a climate catastrophe and a racial <laughs> reckoning. It's like weather is the whole, yeah. is the whole thing. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Yeah, It's such a beautiful conversation. I wanted to um, ask you to read that last paragraph of um, on page 244, which I just sure. thought was so stunning. It took me many years to realize that it's hard to live in this world. I don't mean the mechanics of living because for most of us, our hearts will beat, our lungs will take in oxygen without us doing anything at all to tell them to. For most of us, mechanically, physically, it's harder to die than it is to live. But still, we try to die. We drive too fast down winding roads we have sex with strangers without wearing protection. We drink, we use drugs. We try to squeeze a little more life out of our lives. It's natural to want to do that, but to be alive in the world every day as we are given more and more and more, as the nature of what we can handle changes and as our methods for how we handle things change too, that's something of a miracle. Thank you so much. Thank you for reading that. This, mm -hmm. this book feels like a bit of a miracle. And it's I love that language because of that science and, and sacred grappling that you do. It feels like mm -hmm. the perfect ending. So thank you for, for the miracle of your work. Um, oh. It's a balm to us all in this time. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too.